So yeah, speaking of a little bit about algorithms and bots, um, we'll get more into that now. Um, we've got Dan O'Dyke. Uh, Dan started off studying artificial intelligence for his bachelor and teaching computer science to secondary school students, but now he has a PhD from the University of Amsterdam's Information and Language Processing Systems Group, and he is the lead scientist at Blendle, an application and service, which is backed by the New York Times, which lets you pay only for the articles you want to read. Um, he leads a team of data scientists and engineers who search the news and find the right articles for their users to read. Please welcome Dan Odek. Thanks. So um, this will be qu quite a different talk, I think, than the, the previous one. My background is very uh, technology, uh, and I'd like to give you as much intuition as I can on what kind of things are behind uh, a system, a platform like Blendle. Um, so who here knows Blendle? Who here uses Blendle? Okay, who here transferred some money to Blendle, maybe? Okay, yeah, so it's about average, I think. Uh, I'll show you some numbers later on. So if you don't know Blendle, uh, it's a platform where you can discover journalism. Uh, we have a, a ton of sources. So in the Netherlands, we have 110 sources, I think. Um, in the US, we have uh, some pretty good titles like the Washington Post and uh, Chicago Tribune, you see here. Um, some of our investors include publishers, so the New York Times, and Nick I, who own the Financial Times, um, and Axel Springer, a big German publisher. Um, and uh, the, the, we're sort of a mixed technology journalism company. We have 10 journalists uh, working with us. Uh, our founders are, are journalists, uh, but the bulk of the people there are actually developers. Um, so on Blender, you can actually browse all these titles, like the New York Times, like Time Magazine, and you can buy articles, find them yourselves, and pay only for what you read. So, uh, for example, here's an article from the Washington Post, and you pay $19 uh, to buy this article. Um, Next to this, we also have uh, in the Netherlands a subscription model where you pay 10 euros a month and you get a selection of articles uh, that you can read every day. Um, so to give you a little bit of an idea how big Blender is, we have over 6 million newspaper articles. We get 7,000 new articles every day uh, and only about 30% of our articles is actually read. The rest of it is sort of page filling. Um, our users, we have 1.5 million, I think, right now, mostly in the Netherlands. Um, and about one in five of our users uh, convert to paying. So when you join Blendle, you get 250 credits for free, um, and then about one in five. So it's a little bit more than, uh, a little bit less than I saw here, so you're good on conversion. Um, and uh, this is compared to services like Spotify and Netflix, this is actually a pretty good number. Um, and then we have a lot of interaction data from our users. So we get uh, about two million events, things that people do in our app and how, how we, uh, track them and personalize for them, we get about 2 million of those every day, so that's quite a lot of data. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about are actually filter bubbles, because this is what people are mostly scared of when it comes to personalizing news. Um, and I want to tell you why we create them, and how we create them, and also why I think this is actually a very good idea. Um, Can if you define filter bubble? Um, I, so the, the name comes from uh, a book, I think, by uh, Eli Pariser. Um, so, but the idea is that um, when you personalize, you put people in their own bubble because they see stuff that they uh, mostly like, and this is especially on social media, when your friends also post stuff that, uh, that is more fitting with what you usually read, then you, you could have sort of an echo put of uh, getting all the same stuff every time because you reinforce an algorithm that personalize for you. Um, so this is actually what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn from you, we're trying to personalize and give you as much stuff that you, uh, we think you like. Uh, but we also actively try to break these filter bubbles because we see that we have a journalistic responsibility there as well. Uh, so I'll tell you how we do this and why this is a really good idea, uh, if done properly, um, as I think we do at Lendl. Um, so, uh, for personalization, actually, uh, a, a big driver for our traffic on Blendo is actually a personalized newsletter that we send out every day. Um, so we have an editorial team that, that browses through all the newspapers every morning, and based on their pre-selection, we build a personalized new newsletter for every one of our users. Um, so this is a combination of curation from our editorial team um, and uh, personalization algorithms uh, that do this. Um, so these are some so of our... Yeah. So not everybody gets the same letter? Uh, everybody gets a different one. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. 
I mean, there might be some uh, accidental duplicates, I guess, but uh, it's personal for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, so these are some of our editors uh, fussing over a few of the newspapers. Uh, this is actually a state photo, of course, but uh, uh, this, is, this really is what they do. I, I, I've seen them work, and they do uh, 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 sit down and really obsess about what they are selecting, uh, how they recommend this to people, um, those kind of things. And to give you a little bit of a feel for this, uh, this is, for example, an article from uh, the Washington Post from this summer. Um, with the original headline and how it was presented in the newspaper, uh, sort of. Um, and what actually our editorial team makes out of this in the newsletter is more a recommendation like this. Um, and if you browse uh, uh, and read the text a little bit, you can see that they actually really place it into a context and give it uh, a recommendation that's really something different than just the headline that is in the newspaper. Uh, and this is what, the, what they do every day. Um, of course, the risk here is that this could become very clickbaity, uh, that they want to get as much clicks as possible for these headlines. Uh, but actually, on Blendo, when you read an article and you don't really like it, you can actually ask for your money back. Uh, so if you get your 19 cents back here. Um, and one of the reasons could be that uh, it was uh, not what you thought it would be, which would happen when we give a recommendation that's not a very good one. All right, um, so why do we do personalization? Uh, for that, I'd like to uh, explain you a little bit this distribution. It's called the long tail distribution. And the idea is that um, uh, we actually have a lot of uh, articles in our uh, selection that are almost never uh, read, n never interacted with. And we have a little bit on the top that's super popular, the things that people will find anyway if we don't personalize. Um, so all the way in the long tail, we have things like, for example, can, can somebody think of something that would be Hardly ever read, or never. Like the colophon of a newspaper. <laughs> uh, I actually gave a talk at the, at the press group and they check them every now and then. They pay, I think this is two cents or something. Oh, one cent. Uh, they, they, and they, they check that they're good on the platform. So we do sell uh, one every now and then. And then the really popular stuff, can you guess what, what would be there? Front page news. Yeah. Front page news, yeah. Hmm? Sports stuff. Sports, mm -hmm. yeah. No? Finance. Finance? No, it's, 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 it's easier. It's sex sells. We have some articles with nice pictures that are left out, sorry. Um, that actually uh, is a, still our top selling article. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have, following this, we have quite a few good journalistic stories, and especially human interest stories seem to work very well, like self-help articles from things like the Psychology Magazine or those kind of things. Uh, they sell pretty well. Um, but actually for personalization, this stuff in the middle is really interesting. When we, for example, have a choice between uh, two newspapers and we could recommend, uh, for example, the local newspaper to people from the north of the Netherlands and a national newspaper to the rest of the country. Um, and, uh, uh, for example, uh, further in the long tail, we have a great story about the migration of eel. And if you're into that kind of thing, this is a really great story to read. Uh, and we would really like to find all these niche articles for you in your personal selection. Um, an extra complication that we have is that actually our articles have a really short shelf life. So this is actual sales data from, uh, from Blendo and how old our articles are. So the green bar you see here are stuff from today, then this in orange is the rest of the last week, and then after that basically nobody reads it anymore. So we really need to give you a story right now, and our archive, it's hardly ever touched. Um, so what we have is actually called a, a cold star problem, and we have this every day. So we have this uh, newsletter uh, for which we get 7,000 new articles every night. Um, the newsletter is an important drive for our traffic, uh, but we don't have any use information for these articles uh, when we want to send out this newsletter. So we cannot do things like others like you also read this article or uh, give you only popular stuff. We really have to try to understand your reading behavior and use that for personalization. So how do we do that? Um, we actually enrich our articles as much as we can. We try to get as much uh, uh, generalizations out of this. So for example, we look at the stylometry, how complex is the language, how long are the sentences, how complex is, are the words in there. Uh, we look at the sentiment, we look at the people and places that are being mentioned in the article. Uh, we look at the author, uh, because we want to get textual data, we have to find this metadata ourselves. Uh, we link it to concepts in Wikipedia, so we can generalize across languages. And, um, uh, across topics. We understand that tennis is a sport, and if you like sports, you might like tennis as well. Um, and uh, do topic modeling to, to understand uh, the, the things being discussed in the article. Um, then, uh, actually, how we 
personalize is trying to build a user profile. Um, and we base that on, on the stuff that you actually read on Blendoff. Um, so say we have a user that has read these four articles. Then what we actually do is we enrich these articles as I described before. Then we aggregate this reading behavior into a user profile. And we do this for the stuff that you read, uh, but also for the stuff that you view and the stuff that you give ne negative feedback on, for example, ask your money back. Um, so we have a very rich profile of a user from stuff that we offer to them, but they didn't really like, they didn't buy. Uh, we have the stuff that you actually are reading and stuff that you explicitly said that you don't like. For example, we saw that uh, offering people football when they never bought something is a really bad idea. We have just few haters for football in our uh, user base. Yes. Yeah, please. And the news, uh, is it seen as viewing or is it not? No, no. Um, so we know when our users open the newsletter, mm -hmm. uh, and we see that as viewing. Um, right. So uh, browsing through it, um, we don't have that, that detailed signals, but if you open the newsletter, then we can see that, and we can see that you viewed it. So you know if it's directly viewed or Yes, yeah, right. yeah. So does that mean that the newsletter doesn't load on an email? Because I mean, for myself, for instance, if an email say financial times comes and I can't see the article, I don't know what I just Yeah, see. no, no, so the, the, the content is in the newsletter, but there's actually sort of a small pixel that you don't see that gets loaded when you open the newsletter, and then we know that you opened it. That's how it works. So you, you, you just get so you the... You don't have to click outside of the email? No, 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 there, there's an image that, that you don't see that is loaded. It might even be the Blender logo, I'm not sure. Um, and when that is loaded, we get an event, and, and we know that the user read, uh, opened the newsletter. Yeah. All right. Uh, do ask questions, please. Uh, I'd like to make this mm -hmm. as clear as possible for you and give you really a look under the hood. So if I skip over something, let me know. But you have data on the actual what people click on because mm -hmm. I get something like seven articles a day. Yeah, twelve. Twelve. And you always do some extremely annoying putting the last article in the headline, uh, so you have to scroll through the whole thing. Uh, yeah. Of course. But you know <laughs> what people click on in this twelve yeah. articles. Yes, yeah, we know exactly what people click. And for example, my behavior. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and for example, we, we know that actually putting the, 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 the best article of the day sort of at the bottom, we know that actually people read more because they browse through other stuff and they actually, oh, hey, this is also interesting. So we, we, we tested that with our users and we thought that was a good idea. Too. And do you have um, uh, data on my as person, you know, my age, my my gender. For for most users, we don't. Some of our users connect their uh, Facebook profile uh, to their Blendle account, and then we have some of this information. Um, for personalization, we actually don't really use this information, uh, and the main reason is that we don't have it for all our users. Uh, but also, it's really hard to relate your Facebook profile to your news uh, reading behavior. Uh, unless there's something very, really clear, like you like the, the, the Volkswagen page or something. Um, but trying to get these kind of things out of there, we're a bit hesitant with that. Um, um, because we think the impact is limited. And also, it doesn't seem very nice to do this, to, to build this out of your Facebook profile. But it could be an interesting signal. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so uh, we have this user profiles, as I described. Uh, then what we actually do is uh, uh, we do learning to rank. We, we try to learn a uh, model from your preferences. Um, so what we do is to say we have this user who has uh, read this article on the left or yep, and uh, only saw the article on the right. So it was in a newsletter, but the user did not open this, for example. Uh, and we have another user because we do this for all our users. Uh, then what we actually do is we enrich these articles and we have these user profiles uh, based on their reading behavior. Uh, and then we extract machine learning features from this. So this could be, for example, um, for this, this article, uh, how well does the length of this article match with what the user usually reads? How well does this topic match with this user? Uh, does the user actually follow uh, NSN Next uh, in, in the case of this user? So those kind of features, all kinds of signals that could be an indication that this is a, a relevant article. Uh, then actually the task that we have here is actually trying to learn to predict which of these articles a user would buy and which are the ones that they ignore and because we want these articles, the ones that they would like to read, to be at the top. Um, so that, that's uh, the, the function that we're trying to learn here. So we have a model from this um, and then when there's a new day and we have the new articles to recommend to a user, we actually do the same thing. We enrich the articles, we have a profile for the user, we extract the same features 
and then apply this model so that we get a score for all these articles, how well they match with the user profile, how likely we think they are to uh, read these articles. Um, and then this ranking is kind of what we send to our users. There are a few tweaks to it, uh, but that's the basic idea. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. right. um, so as you can see, the, 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 this really is trying to put people into their own filter bubble. It's reinforcing everything that they do. Um, we really try to understand what is the stuff that you, you want to read and the stuff that you will ignore. Um, so this is not the full story, it is not exactly what we sent to our users, and I'll show a bit later on what we actually do there. Um, so this is actually work, uh, uh, give you a little bit of feel for this. So uh, what you see here are results from an A-B test. Um, so we have a variant A, our old model, and we have variant B, a new model that, that, that should be better. Um, and what you see is the difference in how much people read in the B variant compared to the A variant. Um, so first, during this learning, where we try to uh, learn a bit from this behavior, if you squeeze a bit, you can sort of see the line going up a little bit, but the model B is actually changing during this. So what we do is we, we freeze our model, and then we start a proper A-B test, where we really test the learned model from this behavior from, I think these are two weeks before, and compare that to the best model that we had before. Uh, and those are these results. And uh, what you can see is sort of an improvement around 3%, in how much people read in our new model that we learned from the reading behavior uh, compared to the old model that we had before. Uh, so that's a really nice improvement for us and we had a few tests like this where we can actually repeat this and learn better models with more signals in there or a better configuration of signals here. What, sorry, what was the difference between the two models? Um, so uh, in this case, in, in this test, the, the uh, model A was, was a, a very simple first model that included three signals I think it was the, um, uh, the, the, the topics that you were uh, explicitly mentioned that you were interested in. Uh, the second one, I think, was based on your reading behavior from the newsletter. And the third one on which titles you explicitly said that you were interested in. And then model B had a, a more uh, complex uh, mm -hmm. model that included a lot more of these signals and a lot more of the generalizations that I mentioned in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yep. How can you go negative in uh, amount of articles read? No, so it's compared to each other. So this is basically uh, uh, B compared to A. Um, so uh, there were days, uh, even in the, in, in, the, in the test later on, where model A was actually better. Uh, that, that, that's the negative. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and that is because I don't want to tell you exactly how many articles our users read. Uh, uh, because that's uh, company uh, private information. Uh, but now you can get, get at least a feel of that this model is actually learning something. Um, I can tell you a little bit about it, by the way. For example, our uh, subscribers, the people that pay 10 euros a month, uh, they read about four articles every day from, from our selection. Um, yeah, okay, so th this test showed that, it, that actually this, this online learning works and that this is a way to really improve our model and, and get better reading behavior for our users. Um, in the end, so you could argue whether uh, getting people to read more, whether that's the most noble thing to do or... Uh, but we actually... So for us, uh, if you pay via micropayment, it actually means our revenue goes up if you read more, so that's good. Uh, if you have a subscription, we actually know that people stay uh, with us longer if they read more, so uh, that's also nicely aligned. And for you as a user, you get a lot more value out of Blendo if you read more on Blendo. So all these objectives are sort of nicely aligned and we think this is a nice metric to optimize for and something that changes very uh, uh, nicely with the changes that we make in the product. Um, all right, so uh, we have a few different models that we try. For, for example, uh, a user can also have a cold start problem, as it's called. So when you just join Blender, we don't have any reading behavior, and your uh, profile will not be very rich. Uh, so we ask people when they join explicitly what kind of stuff would you like to read, uh, these kind of uh, topics, for example. And we also ask what titles are you interested in, and do you usually uh, follow. Um, and then applying this model, what we actually do is we sort of slowly switch over. So uh, depending on how much you've read, if you read zero articles, we base it only on this information. And if you read five articles, we base it only on the complex model I showed before. And then uh, the time before, we sort of slowly switch over. Um, so that we have, uh, we, we try to personalize a little bit in the beginning, um, more based on these kind of signals. And we saw a nice improvement of 5% uh, improvement in how much you read here as well. All right, then, uh, as I mentioned, but, we, so yeah. If it's 100% based on my 
former behavior yep. on my profile. Um, it, it means it it doesn't it, it it's never gonna blend on that we that the, the curators say this story is so important everybody has to read it anyway. It is, and it was my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no problem. <laughs> Spoil, uh, uh, and also, it's not 100% based on your on your reading behavior. Uh, these signals are, st are still included in the reading behavior model as well. Uh, they are just less important um, uh, there. But if you change these profile, for example, it has an immediate influence on on, on your personalization. All right. Um, so uh, we do a few more things to to our selection uh, after we uh, try to put you in your filter bubble. Uh, so this would be a selection based only on the relevancy as we see it, as what we think you are going to buy. Uh, but actually we want to get this a bit more diverse, this selection. So what we do is we select the most relevant article for you and start with that, and then look at all these other articles and see how similar they are compared to this. So for example, they might be something similar like this. And what we actually do is we uh, uh, discount this relevancy a little bit for how similar it is. So in this case, the uh, fourth article um, is actually uh, uh, still very relevant, but uh, not as similar to the first article as the three after that. Mm -hmm. And we put that one in front. And then we look at the similarity for these two articles, change that a little bit, and we basically repeat the same thing until we have a final selection that is a nice diverse selection of stuff. Not too close together from same sources, not too close together in topics, uh, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, what we also do is uh, our editorial team, they can actually select a few must-read articles and these get sent out to everybody um, because they think these are the most important stories of that day. Uh, so typically in the Netherlands these are three articles but it's an editorial decision, they can change it every day depending on um, uh, the news and on what they find for that day. Um, so the, the bit on the right, uh, as I said, we really actively trying to make these bubbles there. We put you in a bubble based on your onboarding, the, the information on what you like to read, based on your reading history, uh, and also very explicit feedback on, on stuff you like and you don't like. Uh, but then on the other hand, we are actively breaking these uh, bubbles. We have an editorial uh, pre-selection, um, so that helps with weeding out uh, really the, 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 that you would only get articles from the Volkswagen, for example. Um, we have this must-read section of articles that get sent out to everybody without any personalization. We actively do this diversification that I mentioned before. And because we uh, recommend mostly news from today, actually there's little effect of popularity in our uh, selection as well. So you don't just get the popular stuff. Because nobody has read these articles uh, when we send out the newsletter and we make your personal selection. Mm, but They're it's based on what you expect will be the most popular, though. That's a whole point of profiling. You need to work well, so we're also not trying to profile what we think is, is popular, we're trying to profile what, what would fit with you. And there might be a little bit of an effect there of popularity, there could be. Um, but we, we don't, uh, we have no models that explicitly try to predict how, how good a story will work uh, and uh, how, how, how many uh, of those we will sell. You're not entirely like, convinced? Like just <laughs> Why not? Well, uh, that's the whole point of, you know, you are comparing what is read, what is bought, mm. and by that you automatically put on top, hey, this is what's more likely to be successful, and it, it, I mean, it's intuitive for it to be in a model, and it yeah. should be. Yeah, 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 yeah I agree. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, the, the, this I, I'm thinking mostly this in comparison to just giving you, for example, the top 20 of articles that sold really well yesterday, uh, which is another way of uh, recommending articles, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think you're right. Uh, there is uh, there is an effect of popularity uh, there. Yeah, yeah. You say that you constantly try to break this bubble. Yep. But how do you select the re the relevant like themes? Like for instance, if I put the uh, preferences, I don't know, like sport, mm -hmm. and I usually just read about sport, but they there is this huge earthquake somewhere yep. in the world, and like thousands of people die. Will I receive this kind of news in an I read about. Yeah, so, so the, the must read articles that the, our editorial team select, they usually include the, the really important news of the day. Um, they usually also include a story that, that is um, um, not directly related to the news. Uh, but if there are big stories, they will make sure that they have the best story to send out to everybody and uh, recommend that to them. 
Um, if it also shows up in your selection, it depends a bit. I, I really can't say what this model exactly does for, for you. Uh, but we have so many different kind of ways of putting diversity in there that, that it is likely to pop up in, in your selection. Especially when you sometimes do read these big breaking news stories, then uh, we probably picked up on that. Can you make it even more complex? Because news is also something I talk about with my friends, my colleagues, my family, and apart from my own behavior and your selection, well, it, it has some severe privacy uh, issues, of course. But, yeah. Um, if you would know what my friends are reading, or uh, it would improve your algorithm even a little bit. So yeah. I'm not sure I, I would want that, but on your side I would think about it. You thought yeah. about it, of course. Yeah, we do. So so you do have sort of a, a kind of social network on Blender where you can share stuff with your friends and follow people. Um, but we really haven't developed that in the past year that I've been at Blender. Um, I still think it's a good idea, but it's hard to do right. And, um, what Facebook does. Yeah. Yeah, so and, and we don't really like the way Facebook solves this, so we haven't really touched it because we don't really see an easy solution of putting this in uh, into your selection in your mix. There's uh, something even trickier in China, WeChat and like all these interconnected things actually then play back into the banking system, into like the loan system. So yeah. if you share a negative article as viewed by the Chinese government, you're going to get the worst credit rating. Yeah. And also your friends will suffer that uh, directly through that. Yeah. So that's but like the pitfall of yeah, so associating these things together. And I think that, that that's pretty scary too. Yeah. And uh, sharing with the government what you read on Blender is also, I think, not a very good idea. So you're so, not going to do that? Uh, no, we are. No. So our, our privacy policy is pretty strict. So we can do quite a lot to personalize for you, but that's about it, what we can do. We can share aggregated reading behavior with publishers so that they sort of have an idea of who our users are and, and what users are reading from them. Uh, but other than that, the data stays with us. Um, and then we also only share uh, to publishers what uh, interactions you had with their newspaper. Yeah. Is, is Blender its own owner? Uh, yeah, so our founders are still have a majority share. Yeah. That won't change? Um, not for the foreseeable future. Uh, no, so, um, okay. the, uh, so I think, uh, I'm not sure if I, but I think around two thirds of the company is still owned by, uh, by <laughs> Uh, Blendle and by its employees, um, and the employees have given all the uh, voting power to, uh, the, uh, to the founders. So uh, right now, I think we're okay, and I don't think. But that what, what if John the Mole comes knocking at your door tomorrow? Here's a bag of money. Uh, uh, yeah, we have to see. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, you, you, but we would have to change our privacy policy quite a bit to actually do these kind of things. Is that like, a tricky part in the end, right? Uh, yeah, but as a user, you will get informed before that because uh, our policy now uh, mm -hmm. is very strict and uh, that, that this cannot happen. So yeah, yeah, but now we're going back to the discussion of how <laughs> media literacy works and how people, for example. Facebook implemented its changes and how it deals with information over yeah. time, but people stuck with it because when it came out, it was free. People didn't have concerns so yeah. much about the data. Yeah. We didn't have this uh, collection of data that uh, yeah. back in 2007 or when it came out. Yeah. And of course, people will stick with you even if you decide to sell it to uh, the Chinese government for uh, yeah. aggregated information. Yeah, perhaps. Um, so that's so yeah, I, I, I can only be no, no, as I, don't as I can right now, and, and uh, I don't want to drag you, that you down. I, I do trust uh, Blendo as a company at the moment, um, and uh, given the people that, that run the company, I think this, this will be there for uh, you can trust the company for a while. But uh, yeah, no guarantees. No. no. Uh, I don't know how to ask the question, but because I'm like still in my head, like mixed up about how to. But um, the correspondent, the mm -hmm. right? yep. and uh, they are um, they are really making a topic of how journalism is being uh, uh, how you how you uh, how you work in journalism, yep. what, what your yep. attitude is, and yep. uh, how to go on uh, um, because of the topic, because of the relevance of the topic, and they want to do the topic justice, mm -hmm. and it's more like. Uh, Blender is working for the, um, the users, yeah. Yeah, what the users want, and so I would like to have an opinion about 
because when it's all about the user, what what about the topics? And by bre just bringing three mm -hmm. um, editorials because they are important, is is that just for how do you think about those? Yeah, the, so so I think your, your question is um, I, I, it's a difficult. But yeah, I, but no, but I I, I can see what you mean. So so, so uh, like a, a newspaper uh, editorial room, they 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 feel they have a, a, an obligation to to give a broad view of the news as well. Um, and the, the correspondent has the same thing. They 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 want to cover topics and look at this as a whole. Uh, that's something that that for us difficult to do. Um, because we, 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 we take bits and uh, pieces from everywhere. We try to give you sort of a coherent selection, uh, but we can never do that as good as a newspaper can. Um, on the other hand, uh, we understood from the, the talk this morning that the younger generation are sort of sifting through this newspaper and selecting the stuff that they are, want to read anyway and not looking at it, this full, full picture. And these are mostly the users that we are targeting too. Uh, so I think 60% of our users are the, the, the people that bring two copies in, uh, in, in the coffee shop uh, and sift through the news. Um, I also think that, uh, that people that consume the news that way and the Blendle users, they actually get their news, the, the, the really news stuff, the stuff that's happening in the world, they don't get it at Blendle. They get the background information at Blendle. And for that, um, it, it matters a little bit less, I think, that, that we might not have the complete picture for you every day. Um, as long as we have the, the, the stuff that you want to go in depth in every day. Yeah. Does that sort of answer your question? Or? Um, I think so. No, it, it gives me a, 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 a realm on, on your. So think about it a bit more. Yeah. Happy to take more questions. Yeah, I had a question about the, uh, again, like the journalistic part, because what I understand is that your newspapers write the articles and they sell them to you yep. to sort of make an extra revenue. Yeah, right? yeah okay. so they get 70% of the revenue. Okay, yeah, but it's with, uh, a question about the payment model, because do you think you're suffering the same critiques that sort of Spotify does for musicians? Because um, are you responsible for that, the journalists always in the life of the content are getting paid well? Mm -hmm. Or are you distancing yourself sort of from that? Do you think you have a responsibility in the fact that freelance journalism is a very hard mm -hmm. job? Um, I, I, I think we sort of defer that to the publishers. Uh, uh, um, we, we, we generate an extra source of revenue for them. Um, and so I know for, for some of the, the big newspapers, we, I think they, they can hire, like an ad day for example, I think they can hire about five people from the revenue that, uh, that Blendle generates for them, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it might be because they're underpaid, I'm not entirely sure uh, about that. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. So. Um, but I can, I can, yep. I can help you now. Okay, you cool. <laughs> well, the, the, the question is, is Blendle a publisher or a kiosk? You know, if it's just mm. a kiosk, they have no responsibility for uh, mm. for what they sell. They can sell what they don't sell this kind of stuff. Mm. If they're a publisher, there's another responsibility. Yep. However, the real responsibility is with the organization that hired you, that paid yep. you to pay this, to write this article as a freelancer, because freelancers are actually the ones who either suffer or don't profit yeah. if you have yeah. 3,000 extra sales. Uh, uh, and, and some of the publishers actually, uh, Fila Media, I, I sometimes write for, for them, they say, okay, if, if we, if we uh, have this Blendle sell, you profit from it as well. So we pay you extra, which means that I suddenly, when I wrote an article on something, they paid me at Fila Media and then I tweeted it, put it on my LinkedIn, put it on my Facebook, and I made 250 bucks extra with three tweets and one Facebook and one LinkedIn, which yeah. was not bad considering the work that was done for the article. So some publishers actually do the right thing, yeah. I would say. They say, okay, if you, because they profit as well, but if I wouldn't be paid one penny extra for my effort being sold so to Bandle or to whatever platform that is, I wouldn't do anything to promote it, actually. So uh, there the smart thing would be to develop a model, a model where Blendle, the publisher, and yourself would profit from yep. extra sales in this kiosk. Yeah, and we have a few sources that, that actually do this. Villa Media is nice. Uh, we have the um, um, reports online. The reports online. They, 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 this is really their model. They, they, they pay their uh, reporters by uh, uh, how much they sell on Blendle. Um, but uh, so, for example, uh, uh, 
well-known Dutch uh, uh, writer Nico Dijkshoorn. He complains quite a bit uh, about Blendel and that he doesn't get any money from, from the, uh, the stuff being sold on Blendel. Um, I guess you could argue that he needs to uh, get a new deal with his publisher uh, um, because, yeah, it, in the end, that that's his employer. And um, but uh, the, the the model is interesting, and uh, so we have a few sources that try to do better, and we have actually quite a few uh, authors that are coming to us and offering their uh, uh, um, their their journalistic pieces directly with us, which of course is very scary for publishers uh, if we start doing that. But right now we're still a distribution platform and uh, not directly a publisher. Um, do you think you might have a role in avoiding fake news? Um, or is it a topic within? Yeah, so uh, I think actually we are more of a solution to fake news because we the, the stuff that we get in is, is really good journalistic uh, articles and you can trust us for that. And our editorial team checks the articles uh, that they recommend. So there are a few checks in there that, that, that we know this is just good quality uh, articles. We really haven't had any incidents with fake news on, on Blendo, and uh, I don't see how this would happen. It would have to be in a, in a trusted source, there would have to be fake news, and then our editorial team would have to miss this. I, I, I can't really see how that would happen right now. I mean, this is more of a problem on, on platforms like Facebook, where stuff that isn't as trusted, uh, as quality news as we have, is presented as, uh, as proper news.